good uh, performance of autonomous systems. Let me invite Eduardo Razal, who's the coordinator. So while you go up, but let me tell you that he's the coordinator of autonomous systems training of NECBR and uh, Nakamura, who's analyst of projects in NECBR, and Morrison Modesto da Silva, analyst uh, of projects of NECBR. So welcome. Hello, everyone. We're going to speak Portuguese. So, let us start then. Let me start by talking about tools, essential tools for the proper operation of autonomous system networks. Here we have our presentation of the agenda. What do we want to present? Let's start by talking about motivation and the importance of using tools of um, our networks uh, administrators, and then we start talking about the tools themselves. We are going to talk about some basic commands, some important websites, some softwares and projects and discussion groups where you can participate for your work. So this is our agenda. The tutorial would will be a demo. We're going to visit the city. The, uh, the site with you. We are going to install things with you, but uh, we didn't prepare any virtual machines for you to uh, do at the same time. If later on you wanted to apply this in your network, in your company, I suggest uh, that you should uh, see the video again to see the presentations and go step by step. Let's talk about our motivation. Why did we want to bring this tutorial for you? We see that the network working area is complex, challenging, and critical. What do we mean by that? Well, when we work with a network administration, very often we have a technological um, field that has uh, routers, switches, servers, and it ends up being very complex because you have to manage all those assets in your network. So it is challenging because sometimes we have this has has a very big impact and uh, so you work with many providers many sub vendors and uh, so we see we um, leave uh, if we leave uh, the uh, connections without uh, with uh, uh, any work uh, this may have a very negative impact and it is critical because some of our companies work with health uh, um, companies and transmitting data in real time so we needed to make decisions quickly so the uh, network administration very often must uh, act very quickly and they cannot make mistakes because the impact may be huge. That is why we say it's critical. And there, here we say not all heroes wear capes. The uh, uh, network administrators are digital heroes and we work to maintain the network always working because if not, they continue to have a great impact on people. Those are the people behind uh, the scenes. And those heroes very often are invisible because they are always uh, uh, behind the curtains. And what happens if the network quits working? There are many um, uh, the people started trying to uh, contact them to uh, work so that the network will work. When we give the courses in Brazil, um, uh, some people start uh, sleeping because nobody wakes them up to solve any problems because the network works well. Now, speaking of uh, the networks that we end up uh, facing as uh, network administrators, there may be some problematic scenarios. For instance, they uh, somebody comes to our call center uh, saying that they can't access uh, certain websites. Many 
uh, clients cannot, I uh, don't have uh, any internet access, uh, and uh, there may be people who cannot work. So many clients are there experiencing uh, sluggish internet. So we end up uh, uh, filling in tickets of uh, problematic scenarios, but not just that. That's not the only thing that the administrator does. There are also management scenarios where people have to decide whether they should expand their network or look for more peering partners to improve the connectivity of the network. And in that case, they have to create a new service. So it is here that we start seeing the use of tools to gather information to help in the decision making processes. So it's very important to think of those tools because they can help us make decisions and solve some simple problems. And they can also help us predict some scenarios that may happen, but the tools don't solve everything on their own. We need a network administrator, and that is why we put uh, Batman there. You may have uh, the tool belt, but the tool belt doesn't uh, is not uh, useful in itself uh, on on its own so there are tools we need tools for help us in the decision making process and we can see that this happens in our daily work decision making does not need to be complex just crossing a street but we need tools to see whether we will be able to cross a street or not you have to look at the traffic light to see whether it's red or green or whether you can cross or not and if you try to cross in the wrong moment, you may think that, well, they can honk you. The, um, and all that will help uh, make decisions to complete a specific task. So, uh, and uh, we, the network administrator, needs tools to uh, operate their networks and make decisions. Good afternoon. I. I'm going to speak Portuguese too. Here, we're going to talk about some tools. And let's start talking about the most basic tools. What is the uh, first command? Um, uh, what is the first thing that identifies that we have a problem in the network? Well, before that, let me tell you that I think that the public here is uh, of technical people. That is, we have many technical people here. How many of you are technical people? Lift your hands, please, to see whether I'm uh, right. Well, there are not so many uh, technical people. How does the internet work in a very simple way? The internet has different networks that are interconnected as we can see in this map, we have this format. These symbolize a network. This network is independent, and or the networks are independent. There are, there are over 100,000 networks, and in a technical area, we call them autonomous systems, the AS. It's an autonomous system because it's autonomous to define its own rules and to define policy. And the, it's the autonomous system that will decide what uh, machines to use in their network. So you're autonomous to make decisions. All those networks need to be connected with somebody else. Of course, we're going to see that they are not connected with all, and uh, they're not connected to all the networks, but they're connected to somebody or somebody who's connected to a network and that to another network, and that is how the internet works. There are different networks that get interconnected. And here we can see that we have an autonomous system that will connect down to the end user. We as users at home having access to the internet. So we have a, an access network. We have networks and autonomous systems that are systems 
that will make the internet contents available. So we are going to have contents networks. In addition, we, we well, there are some networks that are not contents, but nor are they access, but they serve as transit to take a packet from one network of access to a traffic one or other points in the internet. So that is how the internet works. All the networks are different than they talk to each other, talking to each, but without a need to be connected with all of them. One network gets connected to another that gives access to another one. So let's see the first problem. The first problem it's the most basic problem that we will uh, analyze. I have a certain machine, a host, but I can't communicate with another, with a certain server. So what is my first test? Here we brought for you that the first way we can try to discover this is using a very simple command that is the ping. This is the ping command. It's the command. This command has two types of messages when we speak of IPv4 and IPv6. It uses CMP or CM ICMP v6, uh, generating two types of messages, echo request and echo reply. So we are going to use these commands for a simple connectivity test. So you put um, uh, you try to access to a machine and we see whether the machine responds to my request. If it responds, the response there is connection, and you know that the machines are talking to each other. That's the command that I use in my machine. I can also use that command from a looking glass. So we put a comment here, here as network administrators and ourselves, we need to pay attention because the network administrators typically block the messages. So sometimes you launch the ping command and you receive no response. So you have connectivity, but as the ping command uses the ICMP, somebody midway will block the connection, so it will seem as if you didn't have any connectivity when you actually do. So we leave this thing here. How can we identify if uh, somebody is blocking the ICMP or ICMP 6? That's a message that's trying to reach a uh, destination. See, if I can't communicate with a certain machine, I don't know whether the problem lies in my uh, network in the first router, second router. Where could it be? So how can I identify that? We have another command that and uh, that uh, is a partner of uh, the uh, network service and it is a trace route that is similar to a ping command. What it does is that the trace route goes hopping and to from one hop to another, changing the exit time, the time to leave. And uh, so it sends a ping to the first uh, a router, uh, well, changing the TTL. And if the message is uh, good enough, it will uh, let you know that it arrived there. Then it's a second hop, uh, and then you have to identify where, how far the command gets, who is in the middle the, um, preventing connectivity. Is it in the uh, access network? in the transit and where did it stop? That's the block uh, place. That is the, the trace route and it serves to, it's, you can, it helps you identify it. And you can see that in your machine and in the looking glass. So uh, is when you use a ping command, you see that there is connectivity and you use the trace route and you see that 
Nobody died midway, but even like that, you can't access a service. Here in this example, we try to reach port 22. What do we do? If the ping came back from the trace route, the trace route was also successful, but it did it failed to reach port 22. So we are going to use another command that is uh, the nmap, uh, the zenmap com uh, command that is used by a network administrator to scan the network, to scan the IP addresses, the ports, and to see whether there are any services run being executed in the IP address and in, in that port. So it will detect that. However, we need to be careful when we use uh, the ZenMap command because that may be seen uh, by network operators as if you were using in your same network. It is well controlled, but if you use it in another network, it may be interpreted as an attack. It's not very good to do that in a large scale in other networks. So there you can use this command in your machine and identify whether the service that we're trying to access is active. The nmap command has a graphic interface and you don't need to be in the command line with a black screen and for those who are not network managers this is not day-to-day -day work so you can use the nmap with this about the zen map for this purpose now here we have a demo regarding the daily operations and i'll give the floor to tiago hello good afternoon i'm tiago i will be making a demo of what we just explained. So what are we going to show you today? The first part of this demo has to do with connectivity. So I think that most of you already know how to do this because this is part of our daily work. This is a classical example. You turn on the machine, you cannot access a site. Apparently, you don't have connectivity to the internet. So this is something that is quite common. So what do we do? We can try and understand what is happening. Now, why doesn't this get connected to the internet? Is it because I don't have internet? Is it a gateway problem? Is it a, what, is it a Wi-Fi issue? What is the issue? So we start checking each of the different options. The simplest command for this is a connectivity test, which we call ping. So for example, here in this virtual machine, we can try and send a ping to LACNIC's site, LACNIC.net. So we send the ping to LACNIC. We do have connectivity. And if I am unable to open a page, this could be a d problem of the DNS. Now let us assume that even so, the ping does not reach destination. So what, how, what can I do? I can use a trace route command. The trace route command will then trace the route to destination. So. Now let me change this over here. We have to change this over here. So here we have trade route lacnic.net and here we have the path, the route through to lacnic. You will note here that we have interesting features. The path that we can view in the trace route isn't necessarily the one followed by the packet. Now, why is this a case? There are a series of factors that explain this. First of all, there are different priorities for the type of connection. So the routers can give you an invalid response or a low priority packet. Also, many end up discarding this along the way. So you might not receive the messages that you wished to receive. In addition to that, 
you might reach the same destination in the internet through multiple paths because the internet was designed to work in that way. That is what we call uh, uh, packet commutation. So each packet packet switching, every packet can follow different paths. So what you saw in the trace route isn't necessarily the path that you wish to follow. So with that aim, there are other tools that can also help us better understand all these routes. Now, one of these is what we call MTR. So it does trace route repeatedly until we can see the multiple paths that you can that you have until that destination so in addition to that we also spoke about a tool that is, that is nmap i won't make a demo here of nmap because this has to do with security issues but this can be used to verify whether there are open ports in given services. So it is very important that inside and outside your network, you run the NMAP in order to verify that nothing was left open that would have been closed. But we say, you might say, well, I have a firewall and the firewall is blocking the ports. But is it is that the case? In fact, very often it has been misconfigured or and it ends up being open. So if we run the Nmap, we can verify our own services. This is important. Now, you don't run Nmap on others' services because this is a port scanning, and this is very similar to uh, an attack. If you do this in another network, this is considered an attack. So when you use Nmap, Please remember to run this only on your own network in order to be labeled as an attacker and also to avoid unpleasant situations. So far, so good. So let us go back to the presentation. So speaking about other problems, in our presentation, we'll always be sharing with you a problems and a tool to help us when we have an incident in the network. Now, in this case, we don't have connectivity. So you might think that this could be a network routing problem. So did my router learn the route via BGP to the destination, or did the other routers learn my route? So we might have a problem of not performing properly. So we can do several things. One of the things is, is to check the routing table to look up this route for that destination to see if you can find it. If you can find it, then there's no issue about receiving that route. But this could also be a problem of the, the other side receiving your route. So this is where you can use the looking glass tool. These are public servers that provide a vision as to how others view your routes. In other words, how they receive your routes. This is a portal, a read-only portal to routers where you can see the information. You do as if this were a router and there are some commands such as ping or trace route what we just commented on. Now we're going to send out the command from someone outside the network. The ping will be done from outside the network. This is a bit different than doing this from a real machine outwards or doing a trace route. So now we'll see how this goes back. You can also check the routing table to see how the others receive your route. Now sometimes you can use a regex to filter the routing table because the routing table is very big and it contains IPv4 and IPv6. So sometimes trying to find a given route requires filtering. In this case, you can use rejects to do filtering. 
So with looking glass, you can often access this from the command line. You can use a protocol to access that machine. Now, many of these can also be used with a graphic user interface, which is available in the internet. So it is enough to just access the browser and find information of a public looking glass and enter the commands to see what is really happening. Now, here we will focus on regex. Normally, this is uh, somehow impressive when you see this, uh, which is called a regular expression. You find the information, and it could be somehow scary. There are so many numbers, so many things happening, and it looks as if this were hieroglyphs, a language from a different world. Now, if you understand the basis of the, how the regular expression is made, you will be able to use this simply to apply filters and look up the information. These are some of the special characters. For example, the dot matches a single character. Then you have the square brackets, which matches a single character contained inside the brackets. So if you look up a digit and you put 0, hyphen 9, you want it to match a single digit between 0 and 9, or uh, may match a single lowercase character or a single uppercase character, and it can also match anything not contained in the brackets. So if I don't want to have a given digit, so I can start with a 0, 9 in square brackets. And regarding special characters, in addition to this, the underscore is uh, used a lot, the space line. Now, the vertical bar is uh, to specify an alternative match. Then we have the round brackets to create a sequence or a marked sub-expression, something that is expressed in a given way. So I want IPv4 within a given scope with a round bracket, the vertical character, and then IPv6 in round brackets. So I'm looking up for a given phrase, IPv4 or IPv6. If it matches one of the two, I want to receive this information. Then we have what we call the position anchors. This is a circumflex. It matches the beginning of a line or string, so it will look, the, look up the information that starts from there. And the dollar sign, which matches the end of a line or string. So this will be easier to understand when we give you examples. So we'll look at the looking glass to show how this regex works. We, have also, have, we also have quantifiers, the question mark, matches the character before the zero or one. It means that it is empty or that there is an A, a question mark. If you have an asterisk or star, it matches the character before the zero. If I put a star, it's empty or A or double A or triple A or quad A. The plus sign matches the character before the plus one or more times. A plus is starting with the first A or the double A or triple A or quad A. Then we have the other brackets which match a specified number of occurrences of a previous character. So I have A and this different um, brackets for. It means I am looking up these quad A or A from one to three, it takes one A, two, three A's or three A's. Here we have some examples. You can apply this to your router. For example, you can include the regular in regex, for example, or look up the paths in the autonomous system. For example, you put at the beginning and the end of the line, you say that this should, uh, these are just examples. You have the circumflex and dollar sign, and it matches an empty AS path, so it will match all the prefixes from the local AS on your router. And I put this between uh, underscore 
I include the prefix here, 22548, and it matches all the prefixes that it originated and transit in AS22548. So this is in looking glass. And can you also, so you put the ASN at the end of the line. So it finally reaches the looking glass and you see if this was generated by you, you can find the information using that filter. So you just have to change 22548 for your ASN. Sometimes you don't need to be an expert on regular expressions. It is enough if you know some of these that haven't already prepared to look up information. For example, if you want to find information on routes that went through you and came from a direct client. So there you can use this expression that I put with the low and underscore and the number and then underscore. And then you get the number in brackets, 0 to 9. And I'm looking up for another autonomous system that fits in here and that can be composed by one or more digits. Now, the, this should be originated but these are my direct clients, but if one of my direct clients were to use a prepend attribute, then regex would not work. But you don't need to create a new difficult regex. Sometimes a wider filter will help you. So you can use the previous one, which is low underscore 22548 and low underscore. This will solve the problem. And it will show your routes, but instead of a million routes, it will be about 15 or 20. So this is easier to find. So this rigid can also help with the configurations. And when you're going to configure your router, sometimes this also reduces the size of the configuration. All right, here I'm back. Now let me show you what Looking Glass is in practice. This is the site of Brazil Peering Forum. There is a good list on Looking Glass where you can use this as public information. The idea of Looking Glass is precisely to have a tool to access things outside your network because within your networks you already know what you have. Now, what happens out in the internet is something that we don't know. So the only way of knowing this is looking up information elsewhere. So here we have a whole series of looking glasses that we have in Brazil and also in, a, in the world. An important thing here is that when you're going to check a looking glass, you will realize that standardization is not very clear. Now, what does this mean? Each one does the looking glass <laughs> whichever way they like. So what will you see then? There will be places where the looking glass is a website or a web page. Some are accessed through Telnet, other looking glasses can be accessed through SSH, and then also you have direct commands. So what can we do with the looking glass? This will vary from one looking glass to another. So we are going to show you some so that you may see how it works. For instance, here we have the looking glass of NTT, and here we have First of all, we have to agree to uh, their terms and uh, conditions. And there, we are going to choose the router that we want to check and uh, its information. For instance, let's put uh, Chicago RL and the type of query. It could be 
a trace route, a ping. Let's let's try and use a ping. We can also uh, consult. We do a BGP query. So let's see. For instance, we can put here consult uh, uh, an IP block. And there, it will give us the response of the BGP table with the information. So it, the important thing here is it was NTT that implemented this. And they make available a copy of the route border is seeing. So this is not a direct query. This is a protected system because precisely external people are having access to the service. And that is why what I can do is limited. Some looking glass systems will only avoid you uh, allow you to uh, see the ping uh, so uh, as to be more secure. Others even uh, allow you to put uh, the information, some uh, additional information in this looking glass. We can even see the BGP table with a prefix. In the um, AS path, the next stop, uh, that is, we see a number of data in the BGP uh, table of NTT. So imagine that you have that prefix and you are announcing it in the internet. You know what you announced. Now, what does uh, what do people see in the other end? A way you can check that is through the looking glass. So you can do that. You find a looking glass that enables you to consult the BGP table. Not all of them will, and you check whether your route really reaches that looking glass. Because if it does, what you did in your site is correct. And the internet propagated it correctly, too, because there may be problems in propagation. So the looking glass is a good way of uh, checking what happened in the other side of the counter, in addition to what you did in your side of the counter. So now let's go back to our looking glass demo. So here we have another attack. What is it? Uh, what are we going to do when we receive a, an attack? First of all, you have to decide whether you are being a target of an attack from another host. I think that the first thing that a good um, uh, it's, um, professional should do is try to discover where the attack is coming from. What is the IP address? That is, who does that IP address belong to? That uh, IP address uh, the, the, of uh, the origin. So we are going to look at our logs and we are going to see that a certain IP address blew, um, uh, the packet with the um, God from this uh, specific IP address. Now, who owns that address? Who's the owner? Is that a network? Does it come uh, from transit? So in order for us to be able to identify, here we're going to bring the who is. So it's the, the who is is a database where we are going to find information on domain names, on IP addresses, ASNs, and other information. So in the basis of who is, we're going to have not just one single base. There are several bases distributed. And sometimes when we consult something or when we discover that a certain IP address is such, is the, uh, the IP that is a attacking me, I'm going to go to who is in the BR registry and consult this IP. What will who is tell me? It will say this IP address doesn't belong to me. So you'll have to go and look for it in another base. So who is is actually the first tool, the first uh, uh, thing that we're going to use to identify whether that certain 
um, ad IP address belongs, uh, who it belongs to. You just have to be careful because there are ways to manipulate this. So there are ill-intended uh, people that uh, will try to do spoofing. They may do spoofing with that IP address and they will change the address of origin and will put a, a private address or uh, and when you they identify uh, this you'll see that you have the, that IP address but that IP address uh, nobody has it, so it's very likely that you will be uh, are being attacked. Sometimes it may come from the IP there. You may see the IP address that identifies it from a certain network, but sometimes you don't even know that that's going on. Somebody um, with Ill, somebody ill intentioned is using your structure to attack you. So, who is is not a, a base that you have to point at with a finger and to quarrel about people and complain. No, it's a first contact that enables you to identify who that IP address belongs to, and you can get information to get in touch with them to explain what's happening. And uh, there you can say, Let's check what's happening because this IP. IP address comes from uh, the network of a client. So let's try and see what's happening. That is, there are several who is uh, databases, and now we are going to show a brief uh, demo of this, how it's working, and with a certain IP address, and how can I discover who it belongs to? All right. So. The first question that uh, the first thing that we uh, want to do is to have access to the who is site and here we have a problem why because the database of uh, the, the base of uh, who is is not a single base so each registry has its own uh, who uh, who is base so if for instance we want to consult uh, LACNIC data, there you see that you have, we put here LACNIC, we, um, so we put the site, and then I want to know what IP we are talking about. So we, we uh, raise uh, who is query, and we'll see this um, slash uh, 22 of LACNIC and this and this will give us the IP address so there uh, what is the mysterious IP that uh, you saw so you can enter uh, who is and you can ask uh, who the IP belongs to but there's a problem for instance let's uh, query the uh, Google DNS uh, uh, and uh, see what uh, what so what's going to happen. It will tell us that that block is not contained in LACNIC's who is base, and that is true. So we don't manage to get the information through the who is here. What can we do in these cases? Well, Linux, uh, Max. Max Linux um, um, can you, you can you can consult in different uh, bases. So it, for instance, it manages to detect that this um, data is in the who is of Arin, and in that case, you can consult Arin's uh, who is database, and they can send us the information. Uh, specifically concerning this uh, um, and uh, IP and my idea is that you can do that with a command line because you can do that in all the who is basis to discover which is the correct but very often it is not in the database that you are looking where you're looking let's go back to the presentation now Let's imagine a different scenario, but before, so let's see here, 
let's discuss some concepts. What does peering and uh, mean? We have two autonomous systems, 65536, that talks with 65537. They want to talk to each other. And the, the clients of one wants to talk with the cli uh, clients of the other. So let's see the autonomous system where one, one will disseminate to the other the routes of the cl their clients. So, and then we have the transit scenario that is a bit different. It gives a path to reach the internet in that case. It's um, uh, AS65536 uses AS65537 to reach uh, the internet. It's different from what uh, my, my my clients talk to the, uh, their clients, and that is the peering issue. Now here we can see some problems, but the problems sometimes are more uh, a management issue you, that you would like to solve. How can I reduce the latency of communication with the clients? I could get closer to the contents, try to do more peering, because it might be that the other autonomous system that we want to talk to is far from us. It may be in the internet and you have to uh, cross many uh, spaces to get there. So what can you do? More peering. But how do you do more peering? How do you manage to reach those other autonomous systems to reduce uh, how can I reduce uh, the traffic, uh, uh, the transit? So we're going to discuss that. Usually the exit of the, the internet has a cost while you're doing peering. Very often it's, uh, there's no cost. So I can't lose, if I can lose the transit, um, if I can reduce the transit, I'm saving. Now, what can we look as a tool? For instance, internet exchange. So we are going to have an IXP that is an infrastructure that uh, uh, get, uh, puts together several autonomous systems to connect and exchange uh, traffic. So here, peering is the most is the clearest thing. But it's also easy to find other services uh, in an IX. For instance transit. But let's try to understand things better with an image. This is IX.BR, uh, so Paulo, that has many providers outside of Brazil that uh, connect in Sao Paulo, and there are over 2,500 participants, and this idea of IX is nothing but a large switch. But when we look at the switch, so then we have some constraints. We think of a physical machine with 48 ports, 24 ports. How can we detect more than 48 uh, participants? So we started to have the switches, creating switch matrices. And here we see how to connect over 2,500 participants. We have the uh, uh, um, central and the remote peers, and the participants connect to those remote uh, picks, and uh, they connect to the rest of the autonomous system. In the switch, we are working in layer two. So we are already exchanging traffic through BGP. We are uh, talking about a route exchange. They are going to talk to each other, exchanging routes, and uh, surpassing that uh, uh, so here we see we saw the people of Mexico discussing the creation internet exchange. We have several in Brazil, and we recommend the countries to follow that model, creating infrastructure to facilitate the exchange of traffic between those. So uh, we are going to show you a bit more of the project. So very briefly, let me show you here the system. This is the Internet Exchange of Brazil, ix.br. We have different localities in Brazil from where we can verify through the map each of the symbols that we see here. Each symbol, as I say, is a unit of the ix within Brazil. The most famous of all is that of Sao Paulo. Here we can see where each data center is located. One 
can see the traffic, the aggregated traffic for that locality. In Sao Paulo, we have average traffic of 12 teras per second. We can also view the topology of each locality. Here we can see it uh, in large, but we also saw the previous slide. And the most interesting part here has to do with the participants. So just a minute, okay, participants. Here we can see the data, which is public data. This is contained in the ix.br site. We can also participate here, even if you're not Brazilian. Many ASs are not Brazilians, Brazilian ASs, but they are connected to the Sao Paulo one. We have all the terms in the IX site. You just have to contact and enter the website. The system then allows you to enable it. So I think we'll be able to open it. So let's go back to the presentation. We'll now start to speak again about some of the concepts. I already anticipate something when I mentioned spoofing. We have the who is uh, database which explains who the ISP belongs to, but sometimes someone with bad intentions along the way can spoof. They can change that IP address for a random IP address. They do spoofing. And that attack, in general, is used, for example, when we are suffering a DDoS attack, a denial of service attack. So if someone, we can see in the image, the machine receives several packets at the same time, and this has a processing cost. So your machine will have to work much more in order to reply to all this. So depending on the load on how much that machine receives, it won't be able to operate normally. So therefore, it will be uh, processing things at a slower rate and might end up, end up breaking. So it won't respond. It will stop the service and will be unable to respond as required because this is you because you are in a DOS attack. This type of attacks is normally associated to spoofing. So this consists in changing the address of origin for some any private address with the intention of bringing problems to your problem to issue your system you get customers call you and tell you well complain that it cannot access the site so there is um, something in the middle that overloads the equipment another problem that we also see that happens is the bgp prefix hijacking here we have a route and the real owner of that prefix is the AS that I'm going to call AS37, the one we see in green. So this is the real owner of that route 2001, colon, DB8, slash 32. But someone halfway through in the internet said, well, this is my route. So they announced this in BGP. And in addition to that, it was announced in slash 48. So they announced a more specific prefix in the internet. So when a third network comes here, AS36, which we see in yellow here on the screen, when they try to talk and access a service of a machine that is in AS32, who will they speak to? In the routing table, it will see that there are two routes. But if there is one that is more specific, that was published by someone along the way. This is halfway 
from one end to the other. So the packets will be sent to the false owner. Therefore, there was a hijacking that took place of packets that should be flowing to AS-37, but are now being directed to the false owner, which is the AS-40. Now, how can we identify all these things? We see that this is a problem, so we need to have ways of fighting against this. We have uh, spoofing problems, we have hijacking problems, and we will also see that these problems are dealt with in another program that we will be speaking of later on, and this has to do with best practices that have to be applied to find solutions to these problems. So how can I prevent my customers from having DOS attacks, denial of service attacks? So one of the first things is that the spoofing attacks should not go out of the network. So for these cases, we're going to apply all the anti-spoofing rules. We're not going to allow those packets to exit our networks. So this is one of the first things that we have to do as network managers. This is in order to avoid those attacks from being coming propagated. So what happens when I'm receiving a DOS attack? What can I do? One of the things we can do is to ask for help and there's nothing wrong about asking for help. So you say, well, I'm under attacks. Who can help? Can you please block that attack? My prefix was hijacked. There was a BGP hijack. So in this in that way, we're going to speak with other ASs. We're going to speak with other networks. I'm going, going to ask them to filter this so that that wrong route is no longer propagated in the internet. So we're not the only one that has this situation in the internet. We need to count on everyone else's cooperation. We need to speak with the colleagues, with friends who are in the internet. So this is where we can help one another in order to find solutions to problems much faster and so that we don't have so many consequences. So this is how the internet works in the form of cooperation. So in this case, we have this other issue. Is there any way to create automatic filters in BGP? I have to add anti-spoofing filters. I have to speak with my traffic to ask to filter the wrong routes. Now the point is that if you do this manually, it involves a lot of work and this depends on the network and on how many people you have that can work on this. This is a way of automating all this, of automating all the filters so that the mistaken filters go out into the air and also so as not to receive false filters. So we'll try to automate the filters to prevent prefix hijacking and route leaks and also to only accept the rules that are registered that come from my peers. and with those with which I do peering. So the issue of filters is a very important issue. You have to be a good internet user. You have to be a good network manager. What does this mean? This implies that the routes that we have, that they should not be hijacked and not to let something pass which is wrong. This is another service, which is the IRR, the Internet Routing Registry. This is an enormous database of where the network managers include their routing information. So you can go there, you can add your information so that others can go there and 
find the routing information. So through these IRRs, you can use programs with the aim of filtering in an automated way. So I don't need to call and say, well, I changed something in my route and I'm now seeing new prefixes. So if I include this information in the internet routing registry in the IRR, all the clients will need to apply some kind of filter. Just go to that database of the IRR and they automatically apply the filters. So there's no need to ask for help to enter the router for implementing that filter because this is one automatically. If I'm using a database such as that of the IRR, I already have, already have some databases like, for example, LACNIC IRR, which is free, RADB, which is a paid database which is used a lot, and that is uh, uh, paid. And then we have TCIRR, which is a free service. So you can use these databases and then automate the filters. Whenever you have to change an information, uh, routing information, you just go to the database and update this information so that you can download all the filters automatically. A further tool that we use, or at least that we should use, and was discussed at length during LACNIC is RPKI, the resource public key infrastructure. This is a way of validating whether the route that is being informed in the internet is should be done so by the person who is informing it. We have a certifying entity that is responsible to state whether that is correct or not. So we have an object that is a ROA, which has the routing information and states, well, I'm publishing this information with this prefix, and the certifying entity will then validate this classifying it as a valid, invalid, or unknown route. So all the network administrators, all the ASs should start to use RPKI for the global validation. This is so that the routes can be validated and so that nobody informs something that should not be informed. All these things that I haven't mentioned, that I've mentioned, are included in MANAS. MANAS is a mutual agreed norms for routing security. This is a global initiative that helps reduce or tries to reduce the most common routing threats. MANAS consists of four basic actions. So if we manage to apply this in our networks, if we manage to make our networks become better, then we're already contributing to the internet overall. So we're going to speak about the four basic actions, about filtering. One of the principles of MANAS is precisely filtering. So you have to filter what you receive and you have to filter what you send out. So we're going to speak about another action, which is anti-spoofing. Manners provides guidance so as to not allow packets, packets with spoofing exit the networks. Another action involves coordination. We have to use certain bases such as IRR to inform to other databases the contact information. Sometimes this can be complicated because you might recall the who is situation when you identify an IP that begins to give an organization. But the information contained in who is was not updated. So I have an email over there and I don't have the contact person or that telephone no longer works or the person who registered that no longer works for that organization. So maintaining that updated regarding the contacts and particularly for abuse is something that is very important. Even though 
we publish that in the website of the company. So you must uh, have a portal available where people can contact you. They know uh, where to uh, find the information and to know who to talk to if they have to solve any problem that's taking place. And here we uh, enter the last pillar of manners, that is the global validation that includes RPKI, validating who publishes uh, a route, whether they should publish it or not, whether that route uh, belongs to them or not. So when we apply those principles of manners, we are not just uh, um, making our network a better place. Actually, what we are doing is transforming the entire internet into a better place, preventing um, uh, attacks with IP addresses uh, leaving my network. I'm not uh, um, uh, uh, sending any routes uh, that I should not be um, sending. My routes are validated in RPKI. So with that, um, the, the internet becomes a better place. And everybody can participate in the project. Uh, you can enter the website of Manners, you have it here and the slide and that. And uh, if you do that, uh, the internet will turn into a better place and we can all uh, collaborate. Now we are going to have a brief uh, Manners uh, demo. So here you see, um, uh, here come back. This is uh, the, the website of Manners. You, you must already be familiar because you've seen presentations. Now the idea of Manners, Manners means uh, mutual agreed norms for routing security, and it has those four pillars. And the idea behind it is to make uh, the internet uh, more secure as a whole. What's so interesting about Manners? It's that uh, you can integrate the community and even here you can find tutorials on how to uh, uh, implement certain practices you have uh, uh, tutorials so of RPKI and manage itself and also you can uh, join as participants of manners and you can say well my network applies uh, implements anti spoofing and uh, manners practices and that ends up being a differential service that you are providing and that has an impact on the quality of the internet manners has a problem and it is precisely that for me to, uh, if I apply it in my network that that won't prevent uh, attacks from uh, reaching me. So sometimes people end up uh, um, uh, um, quit uh, using it because they didn't receive any direct uh, um, benefits. But if everybody did, uh, then everybody would uh, quit uh, having uh, attacks. And it is important to use the filters needed because if everybody does it, then the internet will become a healthier place. And uh, for instance, with no DDoS uh, uh, attacks and uh, spoofing attacks, so that will uh, be greatly reduced if everybody participates in the project. So now I, let's uh, talk about uh, some other important websites that uh, offer you tools uh, that help you identify problems and in the troubleshooting. So let's see one of uh, the problematic uh, scenarios. For instance, you somebody comes uh, telling you that a certain employee or client cannot uh, access uh, a website or a service that uh, they wanted to have access to and they are being unable to do that. But now, is that uh, the problem of the individual or somebody else's? Maybe uh, it may be that other clients in the network are not uh, reaching uh, the services or people from outside the network are not having access to that service. So we have very two very interesting uh, websites. One is the Down Detector, where you can uh, put the name of the 
the service and to see, and there you can check whether there are claims uh, by other clients uh, stating that they are having problems, or you may have information identifying problems in the service, logging or access, and they, because there they collect information of the people that are publishing in uh, the social media. When people report that they are having uh, difficulties uh, having access to a project, and there's another one that is down for everyone or just uh, me. It, um, uh, it checks if a, if a website is down for everyone or just for you. You can ask. Uh, um, uh, is it? Am I the only one that uh, is being prevented from entering this site, or is there anybody else? That is called down for everyone, or just on me. Now we're going to show you the two sites. So very good. Now, very quickly, let me just uh, show you how this works. You access the site, the website, this website is in Spanish, and here you can put the site that you want to check. And here, in this case, um, well, it doesn't find LACNIC because maybe they don't have the what they need for that validation. But let's see, for example, let's put Facebook. And it's going to try check. Oh, I think it's not online. It doesn't know Facebook. Or let's go to the other side, down for everyone or just me. And there, you can ident you can check, and you see that this site is operational. So. Just as we have a looking glass that goes and check access, looking at another side of the internet, these sites do about the same thing. But the difference is that looking glass is limited to the IP and IP uh, routes. If I want to see one of these sites, and looking, the looking glass cannot check whether the site is responding or not. So these uh, websites precisely are useful to check whether the websites are, be, are accessible or not. So it's the same idea, but it is focused on websites. So let's see, here we have Facebook, ah, now it's working. So here, look at this, it's so interesting about the down detector, is that in addition to seeing immediate connectivity, it also shows you the logs of access and connectivity. So if you want to see whether uh, it uh, crashed uh, or there were any problems in the past. You have uh, the uh, history in the site to see whether it, it happened in the past and not just uh, the immediate past, but it's limited to the sites that it's monitoring. Now here we have another problem and the problem that we brought is that the internet is working is running slow all of a sudden it was okay and now it's um, slow how can we as a network administrators how can we think that there 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 was a certain peering and appearing with AS37 and uh, what happened so maybe one of the things is that uh, some of my routes leaked. The uh, um, the path that used uh, AS65537 now is uh, changed, and maybe this route is larger than it should. So you had uh, a certain uh, transit. You had a certain transit, but now it took a longer path. So as a consequence, the packets that leave your autonomous system to reach that other uh, place and back are going, are taking a longer route, and they shouldn't go that uh, 
uh, route because uh, their route uh, um, uh, is no longer there. It leaked. So, and that shouldn't happen. So we have a tool that enables us to do this. It's a Cisco tool, and we can monitor the prefixes to know that is we we can put some certain al alerts to see whether there's anybody publishing whether they're touching the, the prefixes whether they were undergoing any um, uh, prefix hijacking if there are route leaks if there is any network instability so you can use that monitoring tool uh, uh, the BGP monitoring tool and that can be done with about five prefixes free of charge if we want to monitor more prefixes we're going to have to pay for the tool but uh, in principle it gives us that information that that prefix uh, somebody is announcing it. It's a prefix that should not be announced. And somebody is uh, messing with the prefixes, is causing leaks in a route that should not uh, leave. So we do it with a monitoring tool because it is not enough to configure BGP and to leave it there. You must always uh, be monitoring and, and check uh, if uh, somebody is um, uh, changing things so, and so we need to use tools such as BGP mon uh, to now I'm going to show you what the use of the tool is like and here then let's see BGP mon and uh, this uh, is uh, now it belongs to Cisco it has been in uh, uh, in, uh, embedded in uh, their crosswork cloud uh, system. And the interesting thing is that it enables you to monitor the BGP routes. And there are people in addition, and you can see whether there are people in addition to yourselves that are announcing prefixes. If prefixes that shouldn't be announced are appearing in, in this BGP table. So, and not only does it do that, but it uh, generates uh, alerts. Let's imagine that there's a high jack of blocks so they are announcing things that they shouldn't and it uh, uh, sends you an email uh, depending on how you configure it mm, oh well in the case of the free uh, um, uh, tool uh, you can you're limited to five prefixes but here we did uh, the basic monitoring in the routes of NECBR, but here it checks that everything is doing fine. And if anything strange were to occur, you could configure how strange that announcement may be and what you would do with that in the case of generating that. It's an interesting tool precisely to, to, that enables you to monitor things and you see what the internet is seeing and if there's anything happening that you should not you receive an alert in your email so Mm, let's go on with the with these problems we have this one that may have happened uh, have you had many support tickets and you don't know what happened you're receiving many calls people are losing connectivity and while you find out what's happening uh, you don't find uh, the abnormality so there's that idea that says well uh, can we look at uh, what happened in the past to prevent that from happening again in the future? In, uh, uh, here, they hijacked prefixes and uh, they hijacked the traffic. It may have been that they may have keyed in the wrong route and they ended up uh, uh, stealing your prefix, hijacking it, and as a consequence, they are also hijacking the traffic. It's only that here they realized that they had made a mistake. Uh, they corrected the information, so they wanted to see the history to understand what the problem had been in r real life. Here we have BG Play. This uh, is uh, 
a tool uh, that uses uh, the JavaScript web application, and it shows how in certain intervals of time, IPs, prefixes, and autonomous systems, they test gives you what happened in the past. So this is a tool that's excellent because you can even uh, teach with this because you can see what happened at a certain time in the past and then you can explain it to students. We use it quite a lot. But this is a tool, so we might think, is there any tool that gathers a lot of network information and in some cases, also with the BG Play, for example, information, ASN data, or where it was located, and so on. So you can use, in that case, you can use RIPE-STAT. This is an open data platform of RIPE-NCC. This collects data from various sources, and you can search for the information on the IP, on the prefix, what happened at a given moment. Now, Tiago will make the demo. So the RIPE stat is a tool that brings together many other tools to generate data regarding information. So just launching the site, you are able to see the IP you're accessing. You see the ASN, the location, IPv4. So this contains a, a lot of information that can be verified over here, launching right start. So if I try to verify an IP block, a slash 20, for example, so we do the query, and this is the information we obtain. So here we are at LACNIC. We have two announced prefixes in the BGP table. We have the AS name. This is nick.br. And here we have information on the neighbors, the AS path length, the announced prefixes in IPv4, in IPv6. And this is the activity in the BGP. So here we have a lot of information that is brought together here in the RIPE stat. So this is a lot of information on RPKI, our information on who is. One of the things that you can also see here is the information on the history and the allocation history. For example, RIPE stat is an interesting tool because it brings together statistics in different ways, precisely so that you don't have to go into each of the tools. So this, as I said, brings together information from different locations together in the same platform. So we saw, Eduardo, in fact, mentioned earlier that it is more interesting to do peering than transit. Now, in the case of peering, I have a direct relationship with the person, with the other autonomous system. So I'm exchanging packets, and when we have transit, there is a confirmation conversation with the internet. Now, how can I find peering information, where is this information located? I have to do peering with a given content provider, but I don't even know how to find it. And so where can I find that information from another system or from other organizations that also wish to do peering? So here we have a database for peering and peering-related information. And this information is made available 
for peering purposes. This contains information on infrastructure. It contains information on the peering policies. If they will accept to do peering or if you have given types of traffic that goes through the network. And in the case of CDNs, there are some criteria that have to be met in order to do peering with given CDNs. So I can find information on IXs as well as further information. So we have this database here, and it is free. This peering database is maintained by individuals who are not paid to do so. These are uh, people who volunteer for, to do this job. You can register, you enter the peering information there. And based on that, you can start this peering process. Now we'll make a brief demo on peering DB. Now, peering DB is a database containing peering information. So this is to know who you are connected to, because if everyone has that information, you know exactly who is connected with whom. So this is an interesting concept, and it is also very important in practice. Here, for example, in the nic.br, we can see Informa the information we have. This is my network of nic.br. Here in the peering DB, I'm going to enter that we are nic.br. This is the ASN. And look at this. This is quite interesting. Over here, we have the AS set of my clients. Here we have internet services that ask for this information. Sometimes they don't even ask for this information. They say, enter your peering DB and then inform in the IRR, in the CSET. So in that case, you don't even need to talk with them. If you have that record, you already have the information. Over here, we have a lot of information that you can register in Peering DB. This will help you have a site where you can consult information of others too. So imagine you wish to connect to a IXP or enter a locality and you don't really know who the providers are and you don't know where they connect to. So in that case, you have to you would have to talk one by one to figure out which are the correct contacts. But if everyone were in the peering DB, this would just consist in checking here in the location which are the registered ASNs, so you would obtain all the information in peering DB. Now this would be interesting both for processes within the network. So you have information on RRR and Ampering, but this could also be used for businesses, for your business. So if you to reach a given location, if you wish to connect to a given IX, this would help you to understand where those are located, which is the contact information, what is the technical information, so Peering DB is a database that is quite helpful to give you an idea of each of the participants without the need to start contact hunting and verifying information. This is because they are all registered over here. And if you have a register in the in Peering DB, it's important to keep your information updated. Otherwise, if this information is not updated, this ends up affecting all those who will be check that information on you. Now, it is important that if you use Peering DB, 
as I said, that you should maintain updated information. And this is the same as with uh, our PKI basis and information and manners. This is another tool. This is Hurricane Electric BGP Toolkit. This is a web application. It uses BGP data from current electric route views and other sources. It you have AES's connectivity graphs. It contains IP route propagation graphs, AES information. So it compiles information for you. Let's make a demo. So Hurricane Electric's toolkit is very interesting. This helps you compile and obtain a lot of information. So if you check the information on .br, we and use, we're using the information we already have in RIPESTAT and also in PRINDB. So here you can see internet exchanges, the prefixes in IPv4, in IPv6, how these are announced, the RPKI validation. So this contains a lot of information. This is different from the ASN that you didn't uh, research. There are interesting things over here too. Over here, we have some pie charts that have to do with connectivity, with the peers. Here we have a history of that information that is collected. And the most interesting thing, maybe, is the connectivity graph. Over here, you can see from the AS22548 and from where, which are the AS is connected to the initial AS. So this generates a propagation map. This allows you to see all the ASs that are part of this connectivity. This is both in IPv4 as, and in IPv6. You also have information on the prefixes, the prefixes announced in IPv4 over here. This also contains information on RPKI, the ones that are validated. This contains information regarding the peers. And what we saw in peering DB, we can also verify over here. Here we have information on who is. Here we have information on IRR. Over here, what is registered in Hurricane Electric. Site. And here we have internet exchange information. These are ones that had registered in PNDB. We have Fortaleza and we have Sao Paulo. A Hurricane Electric's kit allows you to compile a lot of information, and this can, and you can see how important PNDB is. Here you have the systems really use this. It's not just a database where someone just goes to verify information. There are also access systems that go and check things over there to generate routing rules to understand the network without human interference. So it's important to enter and register the information there and to keep it updated. So we already identified that, for example, this is a problem. I'm already receiving a suspicious packet. We have this origin, the source address, which we already mentioned. We identified in the log that this is an invalid address, a private address that has not been allocated. So it might be that you are receiving bogons Earlier today, we had a talk by John Brown who explained and spoke about the Bogons. He spoke about Com Team Camry, which is the platform that has this Bogan list, all the things that should not be published in the internet, things that should not be 
be going out and should not even reach the network. So Team Camry includes this Bogon list. You can have a BGP session and receive the Bogon list and then apply filters. So I won't expand on this because we don't have so much time. Now I give the floor now to Tiago so he can continue. Thank you. I'm going to show you here. Tim Comrie offers a number of services that are related uh, to security of the internet and uh, maybe the most famous part is the Bogans part uh, as John uh, described uh, they have a number of forms uh, of, of ways to filter the Bogans explaining how you can find them let me uh, I think I think this uh, is off format. I think let's keep it like this. I haven't been able to change it. There are some ways you can uh, do, filter the bogans, and so at uh, Tim Comrie they they show a list uh, of uh, known bogans that you can filter and the other is to do a BGP session with them so that they can send you a list of everything that you need to filter uh, whenever you assign a new block you update the bogan table and it is uh, sent so that you may know that what you arrived should not be in the table and that it needs to be discarded. Here, you need to trust the institution. If anything happens and they send the wrong information, then you are going to filter the wrong information. So you need to be aware that when you use that type of service, that's something that can happen. It is strange for that to happen, but it may occur. So it is important to be aware of that. When you use Bogan's service of Team Comrie, you need to know what's the most interesting to apply to the network. By applying the Bogan filter, we ensure that many things that should not be in the internet are going to be filtered and they won't propagate to the rest of the internet. So now let's see the softwares as a tool. So we have the problem of uh, like spoofing. So imagine that inside your network, some uh, clients may, may send uh, um, uh, messages with spoofing, and you want to know whether the filters that you applied are working or not, and how do you know that? Well, you have the Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis, CAIDA, a spoofer that offers an open source software for testing whether a spoofed packet can leave your network. So you need to use that in your network. You generate uh, the wrong addresses, it sends the packets, and then the servers, if the packet reaches the, their service, it's going to identify that the filters are not working. So there you, you know that you need to make the necessary corrections. If they are working, then they don't uh, receive it and they issue a report saying that everything is working fine. So that is how you can check that your anti-spoofing filters are really working. Uh, what you, you used uh, with the manners and they're working, you know, you see that they're working properly. I give the floor back to Tiago. Let me exit here. So, Kaida, as, as well as Tim Comrie, have many projects, many softwares that are available. 
the most famous may be the uh, spoofer. But there are many other softwares that can also be used to check, uh, to test uh, security issues in uh, your network. It's rather slow. Let me see whether I can uh, access Kaida. Here you can see in their side the spoofer. And there you have the part here to download, where it says download client software. You have the information, the list of services. If this is in Ubuntu. We only add the repository. If you have Windows or Mac, you just download the softwares. So in order for the, to run the spoofer, to you run it. Clients themselves can do it. Now, they're starting validation. Oh, there's no internet. Hmm. Let's try and solve this. Okay. Now I'm going to start checking and doing the spoofer test. It's, so we're going to put together several uh, fake packets to see whether they get uh, your measures and see whether they are really going through. If uh, the network is not applying the anti-spoofer, then those packets will leave the network. And the big problem of that is that spoofing makes it possible to do amplification attacks. So. Um, uh, the open services that, that may give amplification attacks against other people. This is a severe, serious problem. And that is why we have both the initiative of manners and also these systems to validate whether, as a matter of fact, uh, your network is val is protected against spoofing or not. If you want to check the condition of the network, you just download uh, the, the anti-spoofer and you run the test in your uh, machine to have a report of the situation during validation. So here in this lab, I'm behind a NAT. So it's going to tell you that many of the things won't work because you are, are and that the ideal thing is to have your own IP to have a more reliable test with more reliable results. Here we just show you so that you may see how it how it's done. And so uh, th there, and uh, you can confirm that everything is right, and also to use the report to check other people to other people that their network is applying the anti-spoofing. Not only uh, did your site apply the policies, but uh, you, they passed the test and got the approval. Here, when the spoofer test is finished, you produce a link. You can open it in the browser. So here you have a, what a good. Look at this, how interesting. You manage to see the mapping of the network and the spoofing test. In this case, you can say that there was a blockage of NAT. It, you couldn't go on, but you can see the test. And, and everything that passed. Uh, um, despite the anti-spoofer. So this is a very useful software to use uh, in the network. It's open source and it's very user friendly. So now 
we have the problem of the routes. How can I monitor my routes constantly? So that uh, you may know all the time what is happening. Let's use another software, the BGP alert. It's very similar to the previous one, but in this case, we are going to implement it in a machine that is going to be in your network. And from there, the machine, uh, it will generate uh, the alerts when there are changes. So with BGP alert, you can also monitor the RPKI. If uh, the if there are any trust anchors, if there are more functions, if there's a change in the ROA, they're going to send notifications. If, for instance, if your ROA is no longer valid, if there were any changes, all that can be seen with the BGP anchor. So we brought a, a laboratory, but I, I I think that we run out of time. Let's see. Maybe we might be able to do it very quickly very very quickly so here we have the bgp alert and you download it you can even download one of uh, these uh, these are binaries that are executed uh, they are run very 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 user friendly you access the file that you downloaded so here i'm going to put uh, the files that are ready and we'll see uh, this is a, how do you use this for the first time here i have the bgp alerter i wrote i already downloaded so I, I just have to run it so it's going to ask some questions and it says no i didn't see any configuration do you want to auto configure auto configure bgp alert so let's configure this system. Of course, it's so. Let's see. Let's see whether we can improve the RAM cache. So, now it's going to ask for my ASN and it's going to ask me whether i want to receive any notifications if anything happens i'm going to say yes so ready there you are it's configured this is the uh, the basic configuration and nbgp will check on the table what's happening it already found uh, the uh, two uh, uh, problems and whenever there's any change here, it will uh, trigger an alert. That alert may be configured in the configuration um, file. For instance, I can send a message when that happens, just as if it were the BGP, but it, it's free of charge, it's open source, and with a limitless uh, number of routes that can be monitored. So you can configure this BGP alert uh, very simply. So now, finally, let's talk very briefly about some projects because sometimes the problem is not uh, the uh, ISP that uh, where you where you have the problem, but it's the user's problem. So it was thinking of these problems that we worked with uh, users that uh, look for that try precisely to see what it means to be a good internet citizen. We have a project uh, that is called Citizen in the Network, Ciudadano en la Red, Nick uh, BR, with brief videos that explains uh, how the internet works. There are some that work with technical issues of the internet, just 15 seconds, for instance, uh, um, network infrastructure. and and also accountability. What are the duties that we have as users? Security issues, uh, 
and uh, the web standards. This uh, pr uh, project, uh, Citizens in the Network, is available in Spanish, in Portuguese, and in English, so please feel free to support the project. You are invited to, to support. You can, for instance, you can uh, upload uh, the video of your company and you can download uh, those videos and you and you can put the logo of your company so you register you upload uh, the logo and then you can download the videos and use them uh, free of charge uh, putting the logo of your own company that's a way you can support the project and you can disseminate knowledge uh, for your clients so here we already gave some talks we lucy mara uh, yesterday of cert br she's offering a security uh, grid uh, for the internet and some of the chapters have already been translated to spanish so they're available you can use them you and you can download the contents in spanish so spanish So you can access this link here, and these security cards provide guidance as to how to behave in the internet regarding security concepts. This will then allow you to share this information with the users so that everyone can learn about the internet. There's a project that we have that is a program for a more secure internet. This program is chaired by Nick BR, and it includes these three points. We're going to apply best practices against amplification attacks. This CERT BR certifies the Brazilian ASs. If a service is not well configured, then they are notified in order to improve that because those types of problems can then be used for amplification attacks, for example, an open server. So cert.br does this with the Brazilian ASs. In this way, we try to decrease these amplification attacks and so that they don't exit the Brazilian networks. One of the other things that this program for a more secure internet does has to do with manners, namely the routing configuration, issues regarding validation. And also we have best hardening practice. So this has to do with the hardware, the devices, how to configure these, not using insecure protocols, use authentication. And these are the types of things that you can look up in this website. And then we have the TOP in Portuguese is a standards test. So this allows you to check out the standards to see whether the services or the network in a given site already use DNSSEC. In other words, if these are already being developed following the best technical standards, the most modern standards. So you can access this website, top.nic.br. You enter your website, your email address. So they launch a list showing what can be improved, what is the missing information. If the access the site can only be accessed in IPv4, for example. So this will provide you with a lot of information as to where to act in order to improve your site. So, so as not to take up more time, this is a message we want to send you. You as network managers have to share information with others. These are email lists. You have the LACNOG list, you have NANOG, we have Brazil Peering Forum. All these are lists where you can participate and exchange information to figure out solutions to problems as fast as possible with problems who are already involved on these issues. So we don't always look up this information in email addresses. You can also use Telegram, you can use Facebook, WhatsApp, Discord. Uh, see 
what uh, discussion groups you have in your countries so we can improve the networks. In this slide, we include the lists of the tools we showed in the presentation. This is already available in LACNIC's website. You can download all the tools you wish. So having said that, I think we have run out of time. I think we have no more time for questions, but this is our contact information. Please look us up in the social media or send us an email. Thank you very much. We now have a very brief time for questions. You can come up to the microphone or you can also let us know if there are any questions in the Zoom session from the remote participants. So, no questions in the room. Thank you very much. So, goodbye and a big round of applause. Thank you very much.